This video is supported by CuriosityStream. Hey, did you hear they found another wow signal? Yeah, wow. Signal. It kind of got missed in the chaos of December, but there was a story that came out in The Guardian about a signal that was found at the Parks Observatory in Australia back in uh, April of 2019 that some people are thinking could be extraterrestrial in origin. So they're calling it the new WOW signal in reference to the signal that was found in 1977 that has never been completely fully explained. Um, I've done a whole video about it. You can go check that out if you want. Or not. Just, you know, just be that way if you want. But there's a few things about this one that make it particularly interesting. For one thing, it occurred in a very narrow band of frequencies, specifically at 982.002 megahertz, which is very unnatural. Yeah, natural sources of radio signals usually cover a wide band of frequencies. Narrow bands of frequencies like this are what we do to use for communication. And it did tend to pitch up throughout the signal, which could indicate that it was coming from a planet that was orbiting its star, kind of coming toward us. And the star that it came from, or at least it came from the direction of this star, was Proxima Centauri, one of the closest stars to us. It was found as part of the Breakthrough Listen initiative. Uh, they were actually studying Proxima Centauri at the time, so it's been designated BLC1, which stands for Breakthrough Listen Candidate 1. Now, the most likely explanation for this is probably still something mundane. That's usually the case, but there are a couple of papers coming out in the next year, so we'll be keeping an eye on that. But finding strong or unexpected signals is not the only way we can find ET. There's also the lack of signals. This is what got everybody excited about Tabby Star back in 2015 because it seemed to dim up to 22% at very irregular intervals. Now there are a lot of stars that dim irregularly, but most of them are older or a different type of star than Tabby Star, so it was thought that it must have been something occluding the star, something like a, an asteroid cluster or a destroyed planet, or something else. Dyson spheres come up a lot in futurism and science communication circles, which is why it's kind of amazing that somehow I've never actually done a video on Dyson spheres. I've covered the potential Dyson electric car, which has now been squashed, but that's, that's a different thing. So what better way to start off 2021 than to do a video on a subject that I should have covered a long time ago. But before we jump into the Dyson sphere itself, we need to talk about the Kardashian scale. I'm sorry, the Kardashev scale. It's a different scale. The Kardashev scale was named after the Russian astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev, who proposed a scale that could be used to measure advanced civilizations back in 1964. Kardashev's scale imagined three types of civilizations, which he called Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3. Type 1 civilizations can utilize all the available energy on their home world. Type 2 civilizations can utilize all the energy produced by their home star. And Type 3 civilizations can utilize all the energy in their galaxy. Now, obviously, when you start talking about a species being able to harvest all of the energy in the billions of stars in the galaxy, not to mention the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, you're getting into some pretty unfathomable technology at that point. But some people have taken it further. While Kardashev stopped at three levels, some people have expanded it to six. With Type 4 civilizations able to tap all the energy in the universe, Type 5 able to tap all the energy in a multiverse, and Type 6 able to tap all the energy in all of space and time. I think it's easy to see why Kardashev stopped at three, really anything above type two, and the technology gets pretty speculative at that point. I mean, type four and above, things get pretty metaphysical. I mean, we don't even know if there is a multiverse, and I mean, for somebody to control all that, we're, we're basically talking about gods at that point. In fact, science fiction barely has any examples of type four civilizations, because I mean, how can an audience relate to a character who could solve all of his problems with just the snap of his finger? Okay, I guess there is one example. So where, you might be wondering, do we fit on the Kardashev scale? Well, it's been estimated that the total amount of energy on the Earth is somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 16th power watts. So with that in mind, as of 2018, the Earth has been estimated to be at about a 0.73 on the Kardashev scale, uh, which sounds like we're pretty close, but in fact, we would have to increase the amount of energy production by 100,000 times to actually get to type one. We're talking hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes, ocean currents. We would have to tap into all of that to reach a level one status. Now, we don't have to actually tap into all that. We just have to produce an equivalent amount of energy. Some methods we have could possibly get us there, but there's some on the way that could get us even closer. At our current rate of technological advancement, we could probably reach type one status in a century or two, which would be a huge accomplishment for our species. And assuming we don't destroy our planet in the process, it's totally possible. Reaching type two is also totally possible. And that, my friends, is where Dyson Spheres come in. 
Freeman John Dyson was born on December 15, 1923, and died only recently on Leap Day 2020. He was a physicist and mathematician, among other qualifications, and a fellow of the Royal Society. That puts him in the same class of scientists as Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking, and the other famous Dyson, Sir James Dyson, the vacuum cleaner guy. This megastructure that bears his name comes from a 1960 paper on advanced civilizations where he wrote, quote, that one should expect that within a few thousand years of it entering the stage of industrial development, any intelligent species should be found occupying an artificial biosphere which completely surrounds its parent star. Now, to most of the readers of this paper, that kind of conjured up images of a, of a sphere that encompassed the entire star with mirrors on the inside, like an inverted disco ball or something, but that's not really what Dyson had in mind. In response to a reader, he stated that it would, quote, consist of a loose collection or swarm of objects traveling on independent orbits around its star. This concept has since been given its own name, Dyson Swarm, while the disco ball approach is sometimes called a Dyson Shell. But the goal is the same, to harvest as much of the sun's output as possible. And that output is an estimated 400 septillion watts per second, or almost as much as my AC uses in August. Collecting that much energy means that our species would never have to worry about producing energy again, like ever. Which is why sci-fi authors have been talking about this since before Dyson was even a teenager. The 1937 novel Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon called them light traps. 19 years later, Isaac Asimov referred to machines that could harness light on a local and later universal scale in his short story, The Last Question. Long after Dyson's famous paper, an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation had the Enterprise crew encounter Scotty on the surface of an alien Dyson sphere. And that last one is actually pretty appropriate because aliens were kind of Dyson's point. He said that one way that we might find them is to look for the megastructures they would build around their stars. The fact that we've never found one is proof to some people that we're alone in the universe. Or that, you know, we're just being shunned by the intergalactic cool kids. And judging by the last year we've had, that's probably smart on their part. But let's just say we want to build a Dyson Sphere ourselves. The first problem is, of course, it would take a lot of material. How much material? Well, if we wanted to build a solid shell, the, the disco ball idea, at roughly the distance from the sun that we are right now, it would require 550 million times the surface area of our own planet. To put that in another way, it would require us to dismantle Mercury, Venus, Mars, the Moon, all the asteroids in the solar system, and, um, um, Earth. We'd have to destroy the Earth. Now, aside from all the problems associated with destroying Earth, there's also some problems with the shell concept in general that we should probably consider in the first place. For one thing, a solid shell would have a tendency to drift inward, as in toward the sun. Even if it could be stabilized, corrective measures would have to be applied pretty much constantly. Not to mention the solar system debris, like comets, could knock the shell off its axis. There's also the cosmic wind to deal with. In 2018, NASA announced that Voyager 2 had officially hit the heliopause, the area where the sun's solar wind collides with the interstellar medium. And what they found was pretty striking. According to Edward Stone, an astronomer at Caltech who's worked on the Voyager program since 1977, this heliopause acts as a shield that stops about 70% of cosmic radiation from breaking into our solar system. Yeah, it turns out that supernovas are pretty much flinging stuff towards us all the time, but this solar wind that comes out from our sun uh, hits against it, kind of combats it, and keeps it from coming in and, and going into the inner solar system. It kind of works the same way as the Earth's magnetic field protecting us from the solar wind. So if we put a shell around the sun, that shell would be constantly bombarded by interstellar wind, which could make it unstable. Plus, it would make it extremely dangerous to travel outside of the sphere. Plus, the mass of the shell at any given spot would be far less than that of the Earth, so gravity on the surface would be next to nothing. So you would need to rotate the shell in order to keep everything from floating up toward the sun, but that would only work around the inner equator. So what you would basically have is a ring world embedded in a vast photovoltaic desert. It's technically feasible, but seems to waste a lot of space. So, a Dyson Swarm? Would that be better? Well, maybe. A Type II civilization is supposed to be able to harness all the power of its star, but before you can get to Type II, you have to get to Type I, and this is where a Swarm could actually be really helpful. Not only would it greatly reduce the amount of materials that we need uh, if we aren't capturing all of the radiation from the sun, that rest of it can still protect us from the interstellar wind. The key to building efficiently would be to deploy our Swarm close to the sun. Because of the inverse square law, the further away you get from the sun, the more power you lose. One way that we could build the swarm is with something called statites, or static satellites. These could float really close to the sun, collect the energy, and then beam them out where it can be used with laser beams. A statite is basically a non-orbiting satellite that holds its position with solar sails or solar-powered thrusters. It would take a swarm with a total mass of about 91 million kilograms to capture enough energy to reach type 1 status. This particular swarm in question could be deployed at about 2.5 million miles from the sun, but if a swarm could be deployed a million miles closer, it could absorb the same amount of energy at half the mass, again, the inverse square law. 
The planet Mercury has 3.285 times 10 to the 23 kilograms total mass, so mining 46 million kilograms for statite building would barely scratch the surface. Of course, these statites would be vulnerable to solar flares, uh, making sails that are light enough to float a statite without you know, being destroyed by a solar flare would require some pretty advanced materials. Graphene and carbon nanotubes are often proposed as possible solutions, but those are prohibitively expensive right now anyway, especially when you consider how big these things are gonna have to be. I just now realized I haven't mentioned how big these things have to be. Yeah, one proposal said that it would need to have a diameter equal to the distance between San Francisco and Kansas City. So, uh, that big. If some of this is starting to sound familiar, I did do a video a while back about creating solar shades to block the sun's light from hitting the earth in order to cool the planet. Uh, it's sort of the same idea, only in this case, it's actually collecting that light and using it as energy. But a big enough Dyson Swarm a million miles from the sun could both collect energy and probably block some of that light from hitting earth as well. So win-win. But let's just say we decide we want to collect all the energy because you know, humans are so good at restraint. That would mean the end of all the inner planets, including, um, Earth. In the idea of the Dyson shell, we could live on the inside of the shell like I talked about earlier, but if we go with the swarm idea, um, we're going to have this slight problem of not having a place to live. So if we want to, you know, live, we're going to have to get pretty creative. Two futurists who got creative with this idea are Dr. Stuart Armstrong and Dr. Anders Sandberg, who published a paper on Dyson swarms where they proposed that humans could live on O'Neill cylinders, if we're still humans at that point. Because it's far more likely that by the time we're dismantling planets and building megastructures like this, we've already uploaded our minds to computers. So technically, we could just code a planet to live on. Or millions. We could all have our own planet. The Mormons were right. As for the details of how we go about creating this swarm, their paper suggests building a swarm of satellite mirrors using hematite. This is a lot less complicated than advanced materials like graphene or carbon nanotubes, and is thought to be abundant on Mercury. These mirrors would then redirect light to solar power generators at strategic locations in the swarm. So it would start with mining bases on Mercury that dig up the appropriate metals. Step two would be von Neumann machines. These are machines that build other machines, or as John von Neumann himself called them, universal assemblers. These UAs would convert Mercury's metal into swarm satellites, as well as the launch facilities or rail guns that would launch them out into the solar system. These satellites would then gather energy and then use that energy to make other satellites, which would make other satellites, and this goes exponential. At this rate, it would only take 40 years for those satellites to completely dismantle Mercury. At that point, they would move on to Venus and the moon and Mars, the asteroids, and, um, Earth. <laughs> keep forgetting that one. Assuming, of course, that we're uploaded to computers at that point. Otherwise, it would be a fun little man versus machines terminator situation. But either way, even if we just want to create a swarm to reach type 1 status, Mercury's pretty much toast. Futurists and Dyson Swarm advocates pretty much have it in for Mercury. But let's just be honest. Is anybody going to miss it? I mean, look at it. Basically begging to be taken apart. So we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could turn our own solar system into a giant machine. It seems almost inevitable in some ways that should we survive long enough that we would do something like this, but wouldn't this apply to other intelligent civilizations in the universe? Some consider this to be an answer to the Fermi paradox, you know? Why don't we see alien civilizations in the universe? Why don't we see alien signals coming from all over the place? Maybe it's because they've closed themselves off in Dyson shells. In fact, it might be a matter of life or death. Stars don't last forever. In about 5 billion years, our own sun will finish fusing hydrogen. It'll swell up to swallow the inner planets if our machines haven't swallowed them first. Then it'll cool, beginning a slow progression to an inevitable death. Any advanced alien civilization would know that about their own star and would probably have taken steps to use the planets as a resource while they had the chance, eventually finding a refuge on a megastructure. So astronomers and alien hunters look for more than wow signals. They also look for evidence of alien megastructures. Which brings us back to Tabby's star. Unfortunately, Tabby Star has mostly been proven to just be a star that dims at random intervals. You know, the more we look around out there, the more we find that there are a lot of stars that do that. So this is the 50,000th time that something looks like it's aliens and then turns out that it's not. You know, I make fun of this guy a lot, but I gotta say, his world seems a lot more fun than mine. Of course, who's to say that those other stars aren't megastructures as well? Fact of the matter is, we don't have the technology to see close enough to really conclusively prove otherwise. But ultimately, the allure of the Dyson Sphere is being able to collect energy, like massive amounts of energy, like more energy than we could possibly ever use in a million lifetimes. So let's hope that we could possibly do that without having to destroy the uh, 
uh, Earth. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. But until we can create these kinds of megastructures, the fact of the matter is the need for energy is going to define the politics and societal needs of our species for a long time to come. And if you want to get a better idea of how electricity guides how we do things around the world, you should check out the documentary Juice, How Electricity Explains the World on CuriosityStream. Hosted by Robert Bryce, this film takes a big step back and looks at not just how we generate and use electricity, but the way electricity has changed the world, accelerated the growth of technology, and defined the social and political struggles that shape the world today. This is of course just one of thousands of documentary series that you can find on CuriosityStream from some of the best documentary filmmakers from around the world. It was created by the guys behind the Discovery Channel, so it's super legit. Plus, when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, the streaming surface I'm a part of, as well as many of your other favorite science communicators, like Isaac Arthur, who's also talked about Dyson Spheres, so you can bounce from my video over to his, or you could check out his Nebula Original episode, Paperclip Maximizer. Nebula Originals are videos and series that are only available on Nebula. Tom Scott's got a series on there, so does Real Engineering, and soon, I'll have one on there too. I'll announce it at some point, you'll hear about it. Plus, I post all my videos over at Nebula ad-free, so if you were watching it at Nebula, you wouldn't be hearing the sponsor read right now. Just saying. And they're bundling Nebula and Curiosity Stream together at a discount price of 26% off, making it a grand total of $14.79 for two streaming services for the whole year. And what better time to start your year of mind-blowing content than right now at the beginning of a new one? So if you want to sign up, you can go down to the link in the description below. It's curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. You can sign up there. It's seriously the best streaming deal on the planet, and I highly recommend both of them. So yeah, you can go down there, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott. Get it. You'll like it. All right, big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are keeping the channel going, keeping the lights up around here, helping me grow a team. These guys are awesome. Uh, there's some new people I need to shout out and murder their names real quick. We've got Paul Dilly, Dan Lindblom, Jason Bailey, uh, Jacob Bailey, Phil Deshane, Peter and Marie, Samira and Sonia Singh, Tom, Don Juan Javier. How do you get a name like that? That's awesome. Uh, Daniel Lowe, Boyd Dragon, Scott Milne, Vince Ryder, Freder Frederico Arce, uh, Mike Johnson, Evo Fox, Gail Rawson, Andrea Banks, and Selden Joseph. Uh, did pretty good there. Thank you guys so much. Uh, if you'd like to join them, get early access to videos and some exclusive content, and just join a really awesome community, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, um, Google thinks you might like this one, so you can go check that one out or any of the others that have my face on it. And if you enjoy them, and I hope you do, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. And here's me wishing you a wonderful 2021. Love you guys. Take care.